Good morning, it's Sunday, January the 9th. Welcome back to Fisherman's Blues here on TalkSport 2. My name is Tom Ayres, I'm the uh, substitute teacher this week. I'm standing in for Nigel, by the way, who's taking a well-earned uh, Sunday off. He'll be back next week, though, so uh, if you're waking up and hearing my voice and wondering what's going on, don't worry, Nigel will be back next week. We're uh, rattling through the show already. We've got another hour and a half still to come, though, and I'm fascinated to uh, have a have a chat with my next guest. It's Chris Hayden, uh, an angling journalist, works for Angling Times. He's a... Uh, a former colleague of mine, Chris and I worked together. I used to work at Angling Times. And um, one thing I'm going to grill Chris on uh, is is bait additives. But uh, good morning, Chris. How's things? How's your new year been? Been out on, on the bank so far this year? Uh, yeah, good morning, Tom. Um, I have actually managed to get out once, but I've been having a bit of car trouble, which is a nightmare when you've got the holiday period. Um, but yeah, I have managed to get out once on a canal, caught a nice net of skimmers and roach and stuff. So yeah, good start to the year. Brilliant. That's what I like to hear. So uh, we can talk more about your general fishing. I know you're an all-rounder. I know you, you, you do work on the carp side of things at Angling Times, but you're an all-round angler. So we'll, we'll discuss that a bit later on. But what I want to, what I want to pick your brains about is, uh, is the, the murky world of bait additives. So uh, I know that we, we had a, a brief message or two sort of end of last year about this contentious subject. There was It blew up on Facebook and, and other social media that that carp anglers had been accused of using pretty nefarious tactics to to catch more fish. And it was all around rumours swirling of hormones and pheromones that were perhaps from the sort of vet industry and the scientific industry being used in bait to sort of uh, sort of hypnotise carp into coming to their spots and, and feeding. Um, but you did a lot of research into this, didn't you? You spoke to a lot of people in the trade. What What... Tell me about that research and what you sort of learned about what may or may not be going on with these bait additives. Yeah, so um, as you say, it did go pretty viral, the whole discussion about hormones and lots of accusations and names and stuff being thrown into the pot and uh, accused of uh, what would be quite dodgy uh, dealings, to be honest. But um, yeah, I spoke to... Uh, quite a range of different people on the subject from fish farmers, um, bait manufacturers, people in the international teams, anglers themselves, fishery owners. So I've got a nice um, sort of different range of uh, opinions on the subject. And um, yeah, to be honest, there was very little um, truth in any of it um, from what we can tell so far. But if we um, look at the sort of accusations that were made basically it was people were catching far too many fish there were too too many big hits of fish going on um from venues where you're looking at two or three bites per 24 hours some people were getting you know upwards of 20 20 odd fish um and i sort of went down the rabbit hole myself um went into all the all the facebook forums and everything to see what people were discussing and it didn't take long before I got to some of the substances which people were saying were being used. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's like anything where it, it, Chinese whispers, it all starts. And then got to one of the substances, looked into it, looked at some scientific papers, um, found that it had been indeed used in in a sort of fishing, fish farming um, scenario. And it was actually used um, in Australia um, to trap carp, which are an invasive species uh, in the river systems over there. But what, what the people who were saying this was the substance being used didn't realise was that actually this was being injected into the carp in that scenario in this river in Australia to um, effectively, it was a hormone that was injected into a female fish. That fish was put into a cage in the river. She then releases a pheromone, which attracts the male carp to the area so they could all be caught together and taken out. Now, <laughs> I know anglers go to some extreme lengths to catch fish, but I don't think anyone's injecting hormones into carp to... Uh, um to get a few more runs on their local day to get water so yeah that was one substance definitely out of the equation straight away so yeah it was a yeah a bit of a minefield to be honest <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think I saw some of the same scientific papers that that you that you stumbled upon down the rabbit hole, as you say. And um, yeah, it, it's amazing how fishing fishing lends itself to to Chinese whispers, as you say, doesn't it? That that things snowball quite quickly in fishing, and and suddenly from a little nugget of information that that pheromones, you know, do attract carp in the wild, suddenly we're we're left that people are, are, are splashing things on their bait, and they're you know they're they're injecting things and and, and stuff like that. I mean. I suppose the danger, though, Chris, is that a little information is dangerous, isn't it, here? That the anglers could, you know, with a bit of research, and we won't name anything here today, yeah. but with a bit of research, they could probably find um, the chemicals, the compounds that are being mentioned, and just assume that, ah, that must be this wonder uh, treatment that, that I can use to catch more fish, and not know about, A, its dangers, and B, how to apply it. I mean, that, that could lead to some pretty serious consequences, couldn't it? Yeah, exactly. So um, some of these substances, they're only licensed for use in sort of fish husbandry scenarios. So um, I did actually speak to a chap who's one of the only importers in the country of what, again, a different substance that was named. Um, And he was very concerned, obviously, well, we don't want this being used in because they, they were a fishery owner as well, so they didn't want that being used in any of their waters. They said, we don't want people coming to us and getting it. So he actually went and contacted the, the manufacturers in the U.S. and asked them, you know, does this substance have, as far as you're aware, any fish luring properties? And they outright said, you know, from tests they've done, no. <laughs> and then he did tests on his fish farm as well um with just a just a syringe in a tank um and there was the fish showed no no interest in it so it's more to do with i think the application so yeah it's very dangerous for someone to think oh i can just buy this stuff off the internet and chuck it into water and it will do the things it says in the scientific papers that i've read online um which is what a lot of people were in the forums like i said they were just posting these things but not You've, you had to read the whole paper to understand how it was delivered. So, uh, yeah, not mm, something yeah, it, for everyday anglers to be meddling with. <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a, a probably a con- if we take away one thing from this chat, that's probably a, a sensible sort of conclusion. I know that um, yeah, it, you you wrote up a piece that uh, first appeared in Angling Times. It, it's on the carpfeed.com website. If you just search hormones in carp fishing you you'll you'll find it and it's a it's a really well researched piece by by chris that that goes through in a bit more sort of detail that um what we're discussing now and 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 i note that the environment agency uh gave you a quote in that piece and it stated um that while it had received no direct reports the use of any products not approved or licensed for fishing could potentially be harmful to fish populations the environment and human health and the ea also urged anglers to remember that it is an offense under the environmental permitting regulations to cause or knowingly permit entry or discharge of poisonous noxious or polluting matter to waters and that any reported incidents would be investigated i think on the other side of things the other damage that um these whispers could cause chris is is reputational damage and and um, this got quite serious didn't it with with sort of lawyers letters being bandied about some of the anglers uh, and again i don't think we will name them here to today just just to be fair to them but some anglers who'd been accused by association i don't think they were accused outright um but accused by association that you know their results were too good to be true had to sort of come out fighting. And I think it probably affected, you know, some of uh, the top matchmen or top carp matchmen uh, and, and, and sort of uh, full-time fishermen in this country sort of felt the need to defend themselves. That must have been quite tough for, for those anglers who found themselves unfairly under the spotlight, mustn't it? Yeah, certainly. And I I spoke to um, the Adam Penning, who wasn't one of the ones who was accused, actually, but he quite rightly pointed out, you know, it's that the trouble with going down this line is that from now forward anyone who has a big hit of fish which we all know is possible suddenly gets accused of foul play which just which just isn't true in well probably all cases but certainly 99 percent of cases so yeah it it was unfair and you can see you can see why the guys came out and said it because it's their livelihoods for a lot of these anglers you know there are professional carp anglers out there and their job is to go out and catch as many fish as possible while promoting the brands that they represent so something that puts shade on them it is 
is not something they want out there, especially if it's made from stuff which doesn't have any any basis in in reality. Which from you know when when we were doing the research, it wasn't it wasn't just me on this in on this story, um, but when we were doing the research. You know, if there had been something, if someone had come forward and said, you know, we've got this evidence here, we would have gone down that line. But, um, yeah, um, there really is no evidence, as far as we're aware, um, that this is being used or played with. It just seems to have just been too much too much reading on the Internet, I think. <laughs> it's, a, it's a danger that can befall us all, isn't it? Too many, uh, yeah. too many hours spent scrolling through uh, through rabbit holes and, and things like that. And I think I, I suppose we can sum it up by saying that there is no smoking gun as, as yet. But it's a it's an interesting one. I think it throws up some ethical issues. But I think Chris will will touch on those uh, in the next segment. And I think for now, if uh, we take a quick break here on Fisherman's Blues on Talksport Two. Anyway. We're uh, we're here. It's ten to seven on uh, this Sunday morning. I've got Chris Hayden on the line. We were talking uh, really interesting uh, stuff from Chris um, in the last segment about the use or the reported use or the rumoured use of hormones and pheromones by carp anglers to catch more fish. Now, Chris did some really detailed research on this, and uh, as we said just before that last break, found no smoking gun as such that there wasn't really evidence for this, and that I think these rumours had snowballed from from some scientific papers that perhaps hadn't been read properly and um, Chris is still there on the line I want to ask you Chris a bit of a philosophical question what where, where do we draw the line between say that these hormones or pheromones were safe to use say that that they were safe and that they had been approved by the EA but it drove the carp crazy and the carp just couldn't resist and would come and feed over our baits is that is that ethical where, where we all want the next additive the next edge uh, the next coating for our baits the next wonder bait we we spend a whole lifetime searching for it but when we get it is that unethical what what, what do you think sorry to put you on the spot with yeah. that one what what are your thoughts <laughs> yeah well for me i'd say this is this would be a step too far it, it it's not really when you're talking about um hormones and pheromones and stuff it 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 basically is um, the fish are completely defenseless against it. So it would be similar to fishing for them when they are in crazy spawning mode, which we know they don't often feed in. But this would be all year round fishing for them in that mode, because that's effectively what these hormones are doing. It's pulling them all together. So they're all grouped up together. Um, they realise they can't spawn because a lot of them aren't carrying spawn all year round. Or, um, and, yeah, then, then they just feed. That's the theory behind it. That's also an explanation as to why these, some of these things can't, can't be working the way that some are saying they do. Because, you know, fish and spawning is a complicated process, which we know only happens um, a certain few weeks of the year so um some of these catches were well after that or well before that so it doesn't make sense why these spawning hormones um would be the culprit for those for those catches uh in my opinion so what what you're saying then is that you know <clears throat> we're not going to face a moral dilemma anytime soon really because that there are two separate paths here you we can we can still try and and part of the fun of fishing is trying to find a bait that will you know the fish find irresistible from a feeding point of view but what you're saying is that these chemicals and 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 hormones and pheromones were more of a of a mating thing that it that, that it wasn't necessarily a feeding trigger it just grouped the carp together is, is that where there are two distinct sort of avenues on this yeah that's it i mean it it, it would definitely be if it was ever proven to be true, which I highly doubt, it would definitely be a form of a form of cheating. You may as well just put sling a big net out across the lake. It would it would be that effective if it if it if there was any truth in it, which is another again another reason why you can probably point to it and say yeah, it's not happening because as good as these guys are who have put together these big hauls, they do still struggle sometimes. Um, and that wouldn't be the case if you if you had this in your locker it just wouldn't be the case um yeah it would be pretty pointless going fishing if you had this let's put it that way <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think it's a fine line though, isn't it? We we want to catch fish, but we 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 do want to do so in a in a sort of ethical way. And it's it you know it's a cloudy area, isn't it? That what's the lengths that some people will go to to catch fish? I mean, after all, it, in days gone by, bite alarms were seen as cheating. The hair rig was seen as cheating and i heard a podcast i think it was with jason hayward who uh who caught famously caught the black mirror back in the 90s he was on the quarter podcast and, and i think he teased that he he had a rig that he thought was borderline unethical that you know where that it was almost too good to be true i mean did you did you come up against when you when you're doing your research did you come up against any sort of did you get the feeling that there are still bait secrets out there that um that you know uh, that anglers rightly hold close to their chest that that are ethical, but that, that there are there are still sort of things to be discovered that, that some of the best anglers they're not cheating, they're not using hormones or pheromones, but they are using some some bait that perhaps is thinking outside the box a bit. Is that what you found? Y- yeah, one one hundred percent. So I, I think if you spoke to any of these anglers, they they would admit they have edges. Um, and in terms of bait, one of the ones you'll be seeing anyone who follows all the major anglers on social media will notice at the moment is they're all suggesting at least that they're using a lot of natural baits. So going right back to the start, when you started fishing and uh, I'm talking maggots, worms, casters, and in a car fishing scenario, it's how they're applying these to a swim. So it's very, very tight and accurate over their rigs. Now, people might think that's easy, but when you spawn out worms or maggots or whatever with a toe on it linear or wherever on a big gravel pit, there's a good chance they aren't landing exactly where your spawn spawn lands. So some of these anglers have found a way to present natural feed in abundance very, very accurately. And I would say that's probably what the edge is. Now, I might be wrong. But um, <laughs> from people I spoke to, that is the general suggestion of um, what the edge is. Yeah, I think I think that's I think we we, we must remember that, that that there are skills in carp fishing. That, that, you know, all fishing, all fishing. There is you know, what's a good matchman in 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 action and a good fly angler in action? There's there's mechanical skills. It is a sport, and you know, casting at 110, 120 yards and and being accurate is is a real part of it. Not just the the way you can tie a knot and anything like that. There, there's a real mechanical skill in in being able to cast accurately, knowing when to feed. There are so many variables in fishing, as we all know. It's it's absolutely fascinating. I love. I could talk for hours about this this topic chris but um we're, we're going to go to a short break now but i'm going to keep you on the line and uh, into the next hour into seven o'clock we're going to talk about uh, what's coming up in 2022 and perhaps talk some non-carp stuff with you but uh, for now we're going to go to a short ad break here on fisherman's blues on talk sport 2 <laughs> 